illumined upon the blind, and they recovered their sight. Let your face now shine upon us, and we shall be illumined by you. Walk in the way of your gospel teachings, and glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mother of the Light, pray for us. Saint Mary, pray for us. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, I meant to actually make the question last week when we were doing on the on the question of what the lamps were in front of the altars about presence. And of course, the question was, well, what indicates the presence of the Blessed Sacrament? Which I didn't really answer in the end. So, you know, up until the time of the Council of the Trent, you had a variety of ways in which the, the Blessed Sacrament was reserved. And in the East, usually, it was hung in a little gold pick, sometimes in the form of a dove, and it was hung over the altar. So you had just enough if you needed for somebody who was sick or somebody who was dying. You didn't keep huge amounts of the Blessed Sacrament outside of the Mass, but you had enough in case you needed for that day, like you mentioned, someone was sick. And so in the Middle Ages, and even in England, England, they also hung it over the altar. That's why it's a thing, it's a thing among some of the Anglicans to do that. They'll hang their reserve, what they call the Blessed Sacrament. They'll hang it over the altar. The Council of Trent is what made it required to make a fixed lockbox fixed to the altar so that it was more secure. But of course, the way it's supposed to be formed, and again, it doesn't originate with Trent. A lot of churches were already doing this. They made it uniform that all the Latin churches had to do it. And so then it became really just a safe. And so a lot of them were already doing it. But we call them tabernacles. Remember that the word in Latin, tabernacle, means tent. And it has a direct reference to the prophecies in the Old Testament and the Gospel of St. John, in which in Ezekiel, God himself speaks of himself as coming as the shepherd among his sheep, that he himself will come and shepherd his sheep. Because the shepherds of Israel, namely the, the, the governors and the priests, were only fleecing the sheep and looking out for themselves. And so he says, I myself will come and take care of the sheep of Israel. And then, of course, in the first chapter of St. John, our Lord uses that, or St. John uses the term when he says that the Word was made flesh. And in English we say, and dwelt among us. But the term is actually not in Greek, or in the Syriac translation of shra. It's not the term which is used actually of dwelling, living among us. The term is actually, he pitched his tent. That's what it literally means in Greek. He pitched this term among us. And St. John chose this term on purpose because it's supposed to make reference to the Exodus. And when the tent, the tabernacle, was carried during those centuries, or during those years, and of course the pillar of fire, pillar of smoke above it, indicating its place among the placement of the people of Israel, indicating the presence of God. And when the temple was built, when a building was built, it has the same form as this tent did, that, they, that was around, in fact, was around for generations before David wanted to build the temple, and then he wasn't allowed because, it, as the scriptures say, he was a man of blood, and so his son Solomon was allowed to build the temple. And so when the temple was built, it had the same sectioning and the same, the same disposition as the, the tent had already had, the tabernacle always had, and during that dedication, we mentioned it fills with, it's not smoke, but it fills with cloud, you know, indicating the kind of <coughs> presence of God. And then, of course, we mentioned that over the top of the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies in this tent, <coughs> indicated the presence of God. And it would often be with a place where with Moses during the Exodus, 
where God would speak and communicate to Moses and Aaron from that place over this gold box. And so St. John, hearkening back to all of these prophecies and all of these indications of the divine presence among his people, he uses the term that the Word was made flesh and he pitched his tent among us. And so the substantial presence, Eucharistic, that presence of Christ, body, blood, soul, divinity, really, truly, substantially present, is reserved among us in the form, even when it's done in this form of a safe and made out of marble or made out of stone or made out of metal, is still covered in a cloth to always remind it that it is the tent of the presence of the Lord. It is the tabernacle which is why to this day we call that box a tabernacle. And in its an ideal form, it's freestanding. It's not a bread box in the wall with just the door that's covered in cloth, but that's what kind of came into fashion in the 18th and the 19th or the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, and that's what they did. But as I mentioned to you references before, the church that I was at when I was in Kansas City, this is this absolutely magnificent building that was made in the 1920s, it was built. It was constructed in the whole liturgical movement. And so the tabernacle was freestanding. It was in marble, and the lining was a metal safe surrounded in marble, but it had four sides freestanding on the altar with a pyramidal top on it. <coughs> so there was a full silk veil you had to throw over the whole thing because the whole thing was covered on all four sides by this silk veil. So even though it was made out of bronze and marble, looking at it, it was a tent. It was a tabernacle. And that veil, that tabernacle, that veiling is what indicates the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. And it's only been since the 1970s that we pulled all the tabernacle veils off of our churches. You know, only people that did that before were the Germans. In the 19th century, I don't know what got up the problem with the Germans, but the Germans in the 1800s decided, we're not going to do this anymore. And Rome kept reminding them. They had numerous admonitions coming from Rome to say, you have to veil. And they would sell, you know, I don't know why they did that. But then everyone else decided, eh, because you also had directives, there's supposed to be a canopy of the altar. That has been a rubric for centuries. And since in so many places nobody bothered doing it, again in the 60s, they just took the directive out. Well, there was a moment in which they were doing them, and so you got kind of some 1950s chrome and metal things, or wooden things hanging over the top of altars. That was the attempt to make a canopy for the altar. But the altar, that's a very, very ancient signification, like the veils, indicating the presence. In this case, the altar. Not the Blessed Sacrament specifically but the altar, which is why when you see in cathedrals, you also have a canopy over the bishop's chair. It's just a very ancient indication of presence. So whether it's in the priesthood, whether it's altar, whether it's... So you would have a canopy over them. That's why when they built this altar in the 40s, that metal, that marble structure that's on the side altar was on top. It was meant to be at least the residual forms of a canopy over the whole altar was placed over the top of the tabernacle. And you had it cut down, resized, and put off to the side. Because they moved the Blessed Sacrament. But that wasn't the original meaning for its movement. I have actually looked into having it moved back to the top of the tabernacle according to the original altar. But it was way too expensive to hire a mason. And we don't have a quarter of a million dollars like you spent back in the 1980s. Yes. I'm <clears throat> on uh, the processions that uh, Corpus Christi Parish has on Corpus Christi Sunday, yes. and we process for, would process from Notre Dame to the Blessed Sacrament. The um, the priest is, always has the canopy. Yeah, over you have him a large canopy, put... usually carried by four men. Yeah, yeah. And, but when you're inside the building, because remember, the altar in theory has a, has a, a, a canopy over the top of it. So if you were to carry the Blessed Sacrament inside the church, say on Holy Thursday when we transfer it to St. Jude's, you're supposed to have what's called an umbrellino. You're not going to have a huge thing carried by four men on the corners just to walk to the other side of the church. 
but leaving that indication of that place of the presence, you're meant to have what's called an umbrellino, which is basically a really fancy form of a golf umbrella. Done in silk with fringe on it, but you have a server who holds it over the priest carrying the Blessed Sacrament that's veiled. That's what's supposed to be done. Because it's always meant to be, in that sense, veiled. So, of course, a lot of these things we've lost. We still, the Arbolino disappeared a long time ago, because you can't be bothered having someone carry it over to you. And a lot of it's just simply being, if you want, lazy. There's no reason why these things can't be built. And when we use the term, just a moment, when we use the term baldacchino, it's because the original structures were done in brocade. I mean, they, you can make them. When they're done in wood, they're actually called a tester, canopy over the top. And that's fixed either to the ceiling or fixed to the back wall that goes out over the, the altar. And then, of course, when you would make like, um, like an Austrian valance, a canopy and cloth around, a lot of times they were done in brocades. And the brocades came from the Middle East. Baldacchinum in Latin is the word for Baghdad. So when we use, like, St. Peter's, you have that huge canopy over the altar in St. Peter's, and it's called the Baldacchino in Latin. But the original meaning of the word was referring to the brocade fabrics uh, from Baldacchino, from, from Baghdad. So the old tester beds. What? The old tester beds. Yeah, they have canopies over them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, you wrapped the Eucharist before you went into the St. Jude Chapel. Humor yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the best we could do at that point. Okay. And do you know when they changed the altar upstairs at all? 1980s, when you did all the renovations. Oh. Yeah, the renovations. So that's when they pulled it down and put it off to the side and moved the tap Blessed Sacrament to the side. I don't know if it was already moved to the side, but that's when that what was taken it? down and put to the side. Does that, I think before us, wasn't it, Allison? No, I think he's right. Yeah? It was during okay. the... The renovation, we, you know, we were at the Blessed Sacrament for about eight months, and they did all well, that that was a, but that's But that's why that was originally. But of course, since the tabernacle is only this wide, and that structure is only this wide, the side altars they made were much wider. So that's why they had to make, they had to cut it all apart, make a much, much larger piece of marble, and then put the whole structure. That's why when you look at it, you have four columns, and then you have a large piece of marble that's not original to it. And then you have the roof part, right. because it had to be made bigger. So, I mean, it's not the end of the world. We just kind of do the preparations for the oblations. It still links the idea, so I don't, it's not the end of the world. But it probably should have just have stayed up there. And when someone said, well, you can't see, you can't see St. Joseph. Well, you could always see St. Joseph. And now all you notice is that the painter, who was commissioned to paint that painting for that altar, there's nothing below St. Joseph's knees. It's why Jesus is standing on a table or a box next to St. Joseph, because it was always meant to be seen over the top of that canopy. Now you took it down, and the bottom is just kind of black and nothing, because it was never meant to be seen like that, fully exposed. So, in any case. But that's a small detail. So that's why when I came here, because you haven't used the veils for the last 50, 40 years, they were all pristine. <laughs> None of the ones, except for a few of them, the gray, the red, and the gold one that's up there now, which have been skillfully made by your, your, your beloved sacristan. Um, all of the other ones are just simply there, the white ones, the, the gold sh shimmery ones, the, the kind of veily, you know, uh, gossamer one. Those are all just simply in the drawer of the sacristy. They just always were there taken down in the 70s, never put, so there was no reason not to use it. And that's why I've used it. And so, you know, that's, that's what its meaning is. So that's the answer to the question for last week. So that the, 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 the candles, the lamps represent us before the altar, and what indicates the presence is the veil, the tabernacle, okay? All right, so now we're gonna move on to continue with our introduction, and it's what, Father Salim does in this book is he breaks down he breaks down the book in accordance with the liturgy. The liturgy, I mean specifically the Eucharistic liturgy, the Mass. And so it's on the bottom of page 15. So he's going to break the liturgy down into four sections. 
And then he's also going to break it down in parallel with different moments in the Christian life. Okay? So it's the bottom of page 15 in the Roman numerals. So he says, in light of the liturgical setting of this text, so this book, the four parts of the text parallel to the four basic sections of the Maronite divine liturgy, the Alohoyo Corbono. Okay? So we're going to have four, four parts that are going to be breaking down this whole textbook. I put four here, can you still see it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't, want it, I don't want it to be like St. Joseph and just become black. <laughs> I mean, there's feet down there, but you can see that the artist made it intentionally not to be seen. All right. So the first one, and I, I have a few things that I will rework this a little bit. I hope that Abuna forgives me. But So on that part one here, he uses it because, remember, our disposition of our sanctuary. All right. So we've talked about the tabernacle. Let's talk a moment about the way the Syriac churches, there's a book that came out in the last few years done by an archaeologist in England, and it's just specifically on the Syriac churches, ruins, but of the Syriac, the bima, the use of a bima in the Syriac churches of the 5th and 6th century. Okay? So if we're looking down on the floor, and a church is usually kind of basic shape, but this facing the eastern sun, and your entranceway either there, though we also have evidence of doors on the side of the church, not at the opposite end. But in the Syriac churches, what we seem to have evidence of is they used what we call the bema, B-E-M-A, bema in English. But bema, bema in, the Syri in the Semitic language is actually is, means throne. Right? <coughs> I, I, I bow before your throne. Not I bow before your bema, meaning the floor. I bow before your throne. And the bema, and this is from the old synagogue services. And we have evidence of a raised platform that wasn't in the middle of the church, but it was not all the way at the opposite end either. And the clergy would sit around this point, also facing east, like all the people that were around it. Okay? And on this, you would have a pedestal where you'd have the scriptures enthroned also behind a veil. It was called the Golgotha. Right. And that is, like in the synagogue, that's where all of the first part of the service takes place. This is why we have two Syriac entrances. One is to enter the Bema, one is to enter the Holy of Holies. All right. so, all of, so the people are all standing around, sitting around, and the scripture readings are being done and we're all facing the east. That's the basic idea of the bima. That's the first part, number one here, of the liturgy. Yes? Are the people beyond that center where the priests are? Well, it depends, because we also have evidence of a church that this raised platform also has a raised walkway mm -hmm. to the next platform, but they would actually, that's your procession, because what would happen is, remember, in the, in the Maronite church, if you remember, because it was, it was, it's only been changed recently, we always had an Old Testament reading, a letter of St. Paul, New Testament, and then the Gospel. And while the readings were being done, and the, the, the masmoro, all these different things were being sung, the kolo and all of that. See, during the busoyo, the incensation, you're incensing this cross on the bima. You're not incensing the back of a cross of a table that's been moved down off the altar. You're not incensing the altar. Because like, remember, the altar, historically, is behind a veil, the Holy of Holies. So you have a veil there. What you're incensing is the cross that's on the bema, right, on the Golgotha. That's the Husoyo ceremony, our conversion ceremony we've talked about. 
They don't all have that platform. But while the readings are being done, and while that first part of the liturgy is being done, the deacons are preparing the oblations. Okay? And that's why when you're done, then the deacons would go to the altar in silence, and they would put the linen out, and they would prepare the Holy of Holies. And uh, Core Bishop Bejiani um, refers to the silence, specifically silence, to add to the solemnity. Because this is the moment you now enter for the Eucharistic sacrifice. And then when that was done, then they would take up the oblations, and the, and the deacons and the deacon and the priest, they would enter then the Holy of Holies. And that's your second so that's the second entrance that we do in Aramaic, because you're entering the Holy of Holies. All right? So if you see me in St. Jude, because we've moved the altars and we pushed them away from the walls, when I do the second entrance, I actually go towards the tabernacle, where the altar would normally be, to indicate the distinction between them. The first one, we just start on the floor, because we're, we're going to the throne. We are We are bowing before the throne. We go up this platform. Now we have the first readings. We hear the voice of God. And when that has been terminated, we now enter into the divine sacrifice and the veils open and you have the entrance into the Holy of Holies. That's so, your procession. Father, just, just sort of to pull it all together. So this process is preparing us for the consecration. And so we're solemnly going forward. Well, it's, doing, it's doing two things. One, and that's why that's number one, if you look in the book, yeah. he has the preparation of the faith. This is the response to the voice of God. Okay. So we have the scriptural readings, the proclamation of the scriptures. Right. So it's not just a reading. You are proclaiming the word of God from this text. Okay. The Kaddishat, well, we'll talk about it. But that's why, just to give you an idea of the Syriac structure, why, why we do what we do. We're not just simply a form of Roman Catholicism that has some funky things that we added to it. It's a totally different, the essence, the essence is the same. We have, everyone has scripture readings in the beginning because the entire Christian church originates with those synagogue services. So everyone has scripture readings in the beginning. No one does not have scripture readings. It's the old synagogue service. So if you want kind of in a large sense why every liturgy has two basic sections to it, the first part with the word of God is essentially a synagogue service. And the second part of the Eucharistic sacrifice is essentially the Last Supper. And so it's added. So you always have that basic two-part structure to every Christian liturgy. But within those two parts, there's a lot of variety. Okay? And this is the reason why we have a different variety. So if you can imagine the Golgotha being you know, like a stand, like we have the Gospels on the side. But the way we have our churches now, we have these things enthroned in the Holy of Holies already. You're walking into the Holy of Holies and then coming back out. We, we're overlapping all of these things. And so and this is still discussed among the priests. When the patriarch was here in 2016, we had a rousing discussion about orienting our altars back to the east. Why do we stand over these tables? And the, and the bishop of Cyprus, who is the president of the liturgy, well, he's not president because the patriarch is the president, but he was secretary for the liturgical, the patriarchal liturgical committee, um, he said, well, he said, this, is, this just depends upon the parish. And then you heard, <gasps> from the hundred and some priests that were in the room. <laughs> because they were like, no, you're mandating that we have to do this. Now, which is interesting because, say, for I don't really care about this one, but in St. Jude's it just doesn't function because it's such a tiny space. <coughs> and the way we have it walking behind it, if we just pushed it against the wall, we would realize our liturgical tradition much better, you know, at least during the week, and that's fine. But so, it's to understand the structure here and why. And, you know, and the bishop told me, he said in Cyprus, we have many parishes that still have just the churches oriented. He, he didn't think it was a big deal. So we had, it was quite a, quite a fascinating intervention back in 2016 when, when we had the, when the patriarch came for the uh, 50th anniversary. So the husoyo, this incense ceremony, when up here we're standing actually at the, 
the front of the altar, which is the Holy of Holies, and we're incensing the back of the crucifix, what you're actually incensing is the cross that would normally be on the bima for the Golgotha. Okay? I've asked, I asked the, the dean down in Fall River, I said, would you mind if we built a Golgotha? He said he didn't care. But it's one of those things we'd have to ask the eparchy about. Because you know? it would basically be a structure of like our side altar, with a form of some kind of canopy over the top and the veils across that you'd open up and the, the, the scriptures would be inside. And so when you incense, there's a crucifix on top. That's why it's called the Golgotha. And the Husoya would be in front of that. It would Here, it would just be in front of the altar, you know, maybe a foot in front of it, in front of the space of the lower platform that we use for our bima. Then the Husoya takes place in that. And then when it's time for the scriptures, for the gospel specifically, to come out, you just open those little doors and you bring the gospels out, and then you bring it to the place for the proclamation. Okay? So that's, a, that, that's this, an understanding that now you look at this book and he says preparation. <clears throat> yes? Do you have, it looks like our church is backwards. That's I, when you say the backwards east. Backwards in what sense? In you know, it's the east. You mean physically? Is, yeah. Yeah, it's physically backward just because this was the land they had to build on. Okay, all right. I wasn't sure. <clears throat> because they were always, I, you know, and clearly they were always going to, this house was either bought for a parishioner or given by a parishioner. And so you can't put the front door that would have been, you know, the 10 foot space between. You could have put a door on the side of it, but in the 1940s nobody was doing side doors mm -hmm. to buildings. Though you could have easily put a side door like we have at Appleton, and that would have been your front door mm -hmm. with another door just further up coming up closer towards the sanctuary. You just have two doors coming up at Appleton. That could have been done. But they chose just simply to make a classic building, which is very much in... Because remember, at that time, we were part of the Latin diocese. Right. So, you know, all the authorizations are coming from the Latin diocese, but the Maronites were also quite Latinized in the 1940s, and so nobody really cared. You know, I'm framing... I took the picture, the photograph that we had of the first mass down here in 1947. Oh, thank you. I'm having it beautifully, beautifully and custom framed. Big bucks. We'll hang yes. it here. And the founders, the little go there, and the founders will go here. And I'm also framing the founders. Yes. My dad is the guy in the cashmere overcoat kneeling to receive communion. Oh. And Larry Mitchell is the altar server on the right of the altar. Oh, yeah. Cool. So, but, I, but what I'm saying, when you look at the photo, there's like statues all over the place. And it looks like they've got a canopy set up. I, it looks like the bishop came, like something set on the side, probably to do the blessing. So they set up a chair and they put a canopy, it looks like a canopy with velvet and everything, on where the serving window is. So 2022 is our 75th year? 2022, yeah, yeah. I guess, is that it, mathematics? Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Oh, yeah. He's in 1947. That would be the 95th. That was the first mass down here. The oh. parish has been... The parish in, in 2027 will be a centennial. Oh, okay. I'll be 1947, like, hey. Okay, so this breakdown, that's why the number one there on this book talks about the preparation, okay? Preparing for the faith. So the first section on this book is going to be on the aspects of preparation for the faith. And so he talks about the preparation of rites here. Now last week we talked about rites, R-E-T-E-S. And so this is actually the proper use of the word rite, because it refers to ceremonies. Okay? Um, and what he lists here is the lighting of the church. The lighting ceremony is part of these. So what happened is, is when we stopped doing this whole bima and everything during the readings with deacons and all that, and a lot of times because your parish only have the parish priest, the preparation of the oblations then took part at the beginning of the first part of the Mass instead of being done while the readings were going on by the deacons. That's why, you know, when you were children and you were coming here, you had like this 20-minute ceremony of all of this incensing and incensing the, the, incensing the chalice and incensing the patent. And a lot of people just came late because they didn't want to see that part, so they just came late anyway. But that's why the oblations preparation came was just put at the very beginning of the liturgy. Now we just do it before we even do anything. So the preparation is done. And they've just stripped it down to its minimal, its minimal essence. 
So the basic prayer of the offering of the altar bread and the basic mixing of the water and the wine, the basic prayer referring to the blood and water coming from the side of our Lord. So that's done now. It just stripped down to its essential form. We do it on the side before we do anything. But that's actually part of the preparatory rites, but the people aren't engaged in it anymore. And so we start with the lighting of the lamps. And the hymn, you know, these are where you do your meditations. You use the translations that are in there for the lighting of the lamp, the words that are in it, what it means. You know. It's very beautiful. It's a beautiful melody. You know, and it's a very beautiful, there are very beautiful words expressed. But notice that he puts the preparation of the offerings here, because of course, up in the recent centuries, you know, you have lit, you have lit the chair, you have the church, the, the candles have been light, have been lit, and the priest is already out there in full vestments, and then you have the preparation of the oblation. That's why he has that there, the preparation of the offerings. And the other introductory rites, ending in the Trisagio, the Kadishat, okay? Which is again one of those central, central Syriac practices. And it, we'll talk about it when we get to it, what it actually means. <laughs> Someone once referred to it as being the Kadishat song. It's not a song, okay? It has a, spe it has a specific meaning within the liturgy, you know, which is very important. And the Byzantines picked it up. A lot of people have picked up this Syriac practice. The, the, the Romans haven't, but the other, the churches in the East have. Now, what I add to this listing here, because he doesn't put it here, and I don't know exactly why he doesn't do it, is you notice that in B, in part two, he puts the husoyo. But the husoyo is actually a preparatory rite, and I would add it to this number one. Okay? So this is the, the preparation. The preparation, so preparation, he has preparation of faith and preparation of rites. And so he's paralleling our disposition to the faith with the preparatory rites going on liturgically. And that's why we have all the poetry, the hymns, those opening hymns at the beginning of the liturgy that we sing as we process from the, sac from the sacrifice. Excuse me. But the Husoyo I would put in this section, and when we, talk, you know, we talked about the Husoyo as being that conversion ceremony, and it's certainly located within, even, even it comes before the Trisagion, of course. Trisagion just means three holy. Agios in Greek means holy, and then the tris, tris agio just means three holy, a threefold holy. Okay. In the Constantinople tradition, Byzantine, they interpret it as being Trinitarian, about the hidden Father, hidden Son, hidden Holy Spirit, but it's never been that for the Syriacs, it's always been focused upon the incarnate God before us, visible, right? the incarnate, the Christ, the Messiah. All right, so the thing that you want to note here is this, the book is going to talk about dispositions or preparation for the faith, preparing for the faith. But in preparatory rites, the only one I think I want to commentary in this first section is that this is the reflective part of the liturgy of reception. Okay? We're preparing ourselves to enter into the Holy of Holies. And so by the readings and listening to the voice of God, this is meant to be reflective and personal examination. Okay, so if you want a religious application for it, this is the reflective part and personal examination. As I mentioned to you last week, it's the reason why we don't have any form of confitior. Because the Husoyo ceremony is meant to be that reflection and repentance before the place of mercy, the Husoyo. Okay? And so that's supposed to be the disposition. So these are the things that we're going to do more in depth for sermons, because obviously, you know, it's great to have, you know, a dozen people here. But everybody's got to know this, or else we never advance as the people of God if we don't know these things. And so, you know. <coughs> 
way back in the 1950s, would give you outlines how to do so. Homiletic and Pastoral Review was a journal for priests, giving you, giving you outlines of sermons that would only last five minutes. Get them in and get them out. Isn't that great? So, you know, it, what can you do in five? Five minutes is what we do in St. Jude's, and usually longer than that. So. Well, often longer than that. So anyways, this is the reflective part. It's also the part of why we would like to move forward so that there is more of that reflection even before the liturgy begins. So it's not, this is not a conference center. No, the church is the place of God. And so once we've entered the church, if we need to talk to someone, we should go out to the vestibule or go out front or go down to the parish hall because there are people who are trying to pray. If everyone's just simply just jabbering away, one, it's a lack of reverence to the awareness of this is the place where heaven and earth find juncture in the divine mysteries. And we used to be quiet. Again, it's something else since the 60s, 70s, we just developed this idea that it's a meeting place. Well, it's not a meeting place. Protestant church is a meeting place. There's nothing in it. It's just a building, you know, especially in New England. We're famous for our meeting houses. We call them that, right? And so, because there are people praying in the church who do want to pray. And that's also part of the beginning. It's the remote preparation. This is the immediate reflection of preparation to the Holy of Holies, but we have a remote preparation. And so we've already spoken, like, for example, with the question of the Lady's sodality. You know, there's no reason why. The sodality is supposed to be saying the rosary on the second Sunday. No one shows up for that. But now you have, you have a titanic powerhouse taking over as president. And so <laughs> we will see what kind of reform movements are launched. You know. But if we could come to the point where just every second Sunday throughout the year, at 9.30, not 9.42, they begin late and then we can't light the candles because they're all over there. But actually to lead a rosary at 9.30 on the second Sunday of each month. And the ladies make a commitment by joining this sodality to much more than just simply to have lunch together in May and to meet up to give each other's gifts at Christmas time, and the rest of the time just disappear. The Lady Sodality is supposed to be there for the honor of the Mother of God. It's why they wear the miraculous medal. It the Mother used of God. to be, Father. Yes, and well, we can return there, right? We just have to understand what we're doing. But every second, every, so each month on the second Tuesday at 9.30, the rosary begins. And not whispered in the corner, but just simply recited, and those who want to recite with the ladies, recite with the ladies. <coughs> and those who don't, they just do their own prayers. Yes? So it begs the question on the other Sundays, what prayer should be recited again? Whatever the people want to. But the idea is that everyone should be free to be able to do their prayers before the sacrifice begins, the corbono begins at 10, or 4 on Saturday. And so as we get, it's not, it's not you can't talk, you say, you have to talk in the sense of saying hello, not carrying conversations, but understand this is the house of God, this is the throne of God, this is the place where the voice of God is heard in the scriptures, this is the place where God himself appears substantially, body, blood, soul, and divinity in his life, death, and resurrection. It changes, which is why we used to be quiet. Why? We used, because it was one, a reverence for the place. And for heaven's sakes, we whisper in days. We whisper where we used to whisper in libraries. Now, because the second aspect, why did we keep silence within the church, is because it's an act of charity to the people who are in this place right now who want to pray. They don't want to hear about your barbecue or picnic from last Tuesday. They want to be able to pray. So it's also an act of charity to others. Okay. So that's, as we talk about this section one, this is the idea of the preparation of the faith. Because as we go through that first section of the book, it's going to be very much on the idea of hearing the voice of God. Okay? So that's section one. It's reflective in the personal examination. Okay. Is there caffeine? There's well, no there's coffee, at least sugar, so that's good there's, enough. There's okay. sugar, okay. there's okay. sugar and water. He's working on caffeine. Okay. No, I, okay. no, he's Thank you, Brian. Steve. How many pages are there? It's just the introduction. That's 1, the end of the introduction. Once we've got this done, <laughs> this, is, this is the end of the introduction. So, 
Notice what he puts at the bottom of 16 is, one enters the church building and prepares for the hearing of the word of the scriptures. So I'm merging together his commentary. He gives part 1, 2, 3, 4, and then part 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm just merging them together under one Roman numeral. So we enter the church, and he says at this point, preparation of the faith he's mentioned, this is the initial stage for the inquirer, seeking God. Okay, so he parallels it with the first part of the Mass. All right, so the second part is the Word of God. This is the actual proclamation. This is, this is the important thing about, you know, reading. You know, we'll find out when we get tomorrow at the funeral, but, you know, someone says they have a niece and she's a reader. I know everyone can read, <laughs> but reading is not the same as being a reader. Being a reader is proclaiming the sacred text in an audible manner for people to understand. When I first started reading things and I started preaching in the beginning 30 years ago, everyone's like, we can't understand you. Because I got up and I spoke in the pulpit or reading like I was talking to someone. But of course, all the words just go blah, 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 because of the sound and the echo in the system. It's like when you sing, and they always tell you, don't pay attention to what you look like. You know, because your face is stretched out or whatever you're doing. They <laughs> tell you, don't think about that, just make the sound. It's the same thing. When you do a reading, you will look like an idiot <laughs> because you are pronouncing every letter. Not letter. Letter. And so, otherwise, you don't hear it. It's like when singing, and we always chew up the last syllable when we sing something. And so, the words. Look, when I was in New York, we used to have a woman who sang in Lincoln Center. So she, she was Swedish. She sung at the UN, full assemblies, and sung for the king and, king and queen of Sweden. She was the prima donna. She was really quite something. A lovely lady, but you could tell she, what circles socially she ran in. But she was the one to make sure, she actually took over the choir at one point to make sure that they sung with annunciation. And that's why it's important to understand that we're not just reading something that you also heard last year. We're not just reading something that you can read at home. We are making the liturgical amnesis, the memorial of God, where this text becomes alive now because this is the sacred mystery. It's not like reading scripture at home. This is a proclamation of the voice of the living God being done through his ministers within the house of God and this place of his throne, the Bema. When we understand that, everything falls into place. A lot of things don't fall into place because we don't really understand what the heck we are doing. And it's that ignorance that we have to try to clarify and bring forward. It's no one's fault. It's just we've let the whole thing just bottom up for the last 50 years. You know, and in the Eastern tradition, you'd be ordained to the order of readers. And a lot of times it was the 14-year-old boys. The same boys who are serving would read. And often they didn't have an anvil. they just hold the book up and face everyone and do the reading. These 14-year-olds, you know, and their vestments and everything because they were officially <coughs> deputed, that's what ordination is, to be reading within the house of God. What we do with everybody just kind of like shuffling up is in the 70s we decided that we we're going to do something paraliturgical and we'll just appoint somebody. So Mrs. McGillicuddy, you want to read? Oh, sure, Father, I do that. And then she'll shuffle up and she'll read. And there's nothing wrong with it, we, we know it's allowed, but again, it's not just simply, hey, can you read today? It's, there's training behind this and to understand what you do. You stand as the mouthpiece of God at that moment. You know, which is why, actually, the same way I mentioned these 14-year-olds wearing their cassocks or whatever, I think if someone's going to be a reader, they should have some kind of insignia to indicate that, you know, let alone dressed appropriately. And I've been at some of our national meetings where these kids come shuffling up in shorts and they're like, <laughs> not my kids, it's my not my parish, never, but you know, you're just looking at this kind. Can't you at least get dressed for one occasion? 
Well, okay. So that's why I'm emphasizing, you know what he puts here, the word of God. This is the voice of the prophets. And he mentions it's the foundation of our faith. So now, it's not a disposition of the faith, but this is God who speaks to us. Okay. And so now he's talking about foundation. It's not a proof of God, it's the basis. It's the base, it's the foundation of our faith. We don't have faith if we never hear. Right? The hearing, that's why it's the foundation of faith. So that's why he ranks the first part as equivalent in parallel of that text down below with the seeker, the one who's inquiring. But you'll notice here, so he puts the who saw you here, but like I said, I wouldn't, I cross that off. I, I, it, it goes in the first part. What is having here, this is where the Kadishat should actually be. The Kadishat is an enthronement, in a sense, if you want, an enthronement psalm of the proclamation before the holy place. All right? You are holy, O oh God. You are holy, O oh mighty one. You are holy, Literally, we translate it as immortal, but it means the non-dying one. You do not die. Lo, lo is the negation. Okay? Chayel tono lomo yuto. So the lo means the non-dying one. And then therefore, have mercy on us, this bow, this profound bow from the waist for those who are physically able to still do so. But it's this profound bow that is part of this conversion. And we do this three times. And now we are before the place of mercy and the Husoyo asking for the repentance and the forgiveness of our sins, which of course continues throughout the whole thing. And then to listen to the place of God of the Holy One. Okay, so the Kadishat should actually be in a sense. So we end with the Husoyo and the preparation before, and then we have Kadishat and then our epistle, gospel. I'm sorry? With a Q. Thank you. Because it's Chodishat. A Q is down here. A K is up here. Mm -hmm. Right? Kaf, Queen. Queen is actually down here. Chodishat. But um, Kadomar. To speak. Kadomar. So there's two Q sounds, two K sounds, if you want. But they are different. So, the second part then in the foundation of the service of the word, or the liturgy of the word, the Latins will call this. But they don't have the Kadishat and all the rest of it. So what we have here is this is the vocal. This is the voice of God. Or, if you want, vocal presence. Okay? That's why it's a very specific office. And again, you know, I've heard 10-year-olds be excellent readers. They know what they're doing, they enunciate it all, that's fine. And I've heard adults just kind of blow it up through the whole thing and just butcher the sacred text. So it's not a question of age or gender or anything, it's just a question of knowing what we are doing. And it's not a question of saying, well, because it's a wedding, we have to make sure I get my nephew involved. So can he read this? And it's like, that's not what this is. We've lost so much of this idea. And it becomes now, if you say no, they're never going to see you again. You know? You're not ever going to get dime of my money because you wouldn't let my nephew read. And it's like, well, does your nephew know how to do this? They can read. Not about read. I'm sure he can read. Yes, I'm sure he can read. This is, but this is, this is a, this is a proclamation. And so, it's why I say it's a vocal presence of the divine. It is the prophetic texts which are proclaimed. And so that's why the bima is something that's elevated in the synagogal disposition of the church. Okay. So this is our attentive response. So not just reflective, 
but attentive. We are consciously, after the Busoyo and the Kavisha, we are with attention listening to this. We're not rummaging around to find the check for the collection. We're not checking our phone. We're not, you know, whatever. The voice of God is now reverberating in this sacred place. And that's why in parallel, if you look at the, uh, towards the bottom of the page, he gives part two. The second stage, the catechumen, the inquirer, the catechumen now. So the catechumen is more than an inquirer. The catechumen is someone who's already placed their feet to enter the church. So the catechumen hears the word of God proclaimed and explains to them. Why so I wasn't at the parish council last night, because we have to get these boys through the catechism. It's a big book. There are 194 chapters in this book. Okay. So they're taking, you know, that's why we're taking these, these kids and Sharon and Danielle, they're going to have done two years of catechism, every single, well, almost every single week. Uh, but they're going to know it. You know, I will be able to go to my grave that there are four people in this parish that I left behind who know it backwards and forward. Now, how well they can explain it later on is another question. I don't need to put them on the spot. But, in fact, it was actually quite charming last night because the boys, we were talking, because we were doing the part on the organization of the church. So we were talking about the hierarchy and everything. And of course, the one chapter 56 or whatever it is is on the Eastern churches. And it talks about Mary men being ordained to the priesthood. This is, a, this is a catechism book from the 50s. So we're explaining all of that and all of that thing. And then one of them goes bingo and he says, you know, from the sermon when we said that on the moment of your death, the first question, the divine justice will ask you is, where are your children? And the second question will be, why? What did you do with your singular trust? And so one of these young men said to me, so that question won't be asked to you. I said, what are you talking about? Why do you think they call me a Buddha? And they said, well, because you, you don't have any children. And I looked at them and I said, you're my children. I said, you know, it's different just to answer for five people. But of all the thousands of people I have met over the last 30 years of priesthood, I have to give an answer for these people because I have been on part of their path towards the kingdom. And so, no, that question will be asked. And they're like, ooh. <laughs> so later on, when we started doing the papacy, I said, so imagine when you're po you pope and you go to your death and you have to answer the question for the 1.2 billion Catholics baptized throughout the world. What did you do to lead them all towards the kingdom in its fullness? Yes? Hence the room of tears when... Um, yeah, it's called the room of tears, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for some of them, it certainly was in the, in the, in the right sense. But yeah, I'm, knowing all the history of the church and all the jockeying to become king of central Italy, I'm not too sure that everybody was weeping. They probably went in there and there was a fist pump and then pick out which white cassock they're going to wear after the election. <laughs> I don't know, human nature doesn't change. You know. No, it doesn't. We all have to strive for fidelity. All right, so that's why in the second part there, he's got what we'll cover in this book will be the fact of hearing the proclamation and the explanation. That's why the original meaning of catechesis is something that you receive by hearing. The catechesis. Something that you receive in hearing. All right, so that's number two. Number three, that God's kingdom, he, so he lists here as being part C or part three, God's kingdom, the already or the not yet. Okay. So he's breaking this down now for the transfer. We're moving from that first part. So in other words, the first part leads all the way up with the homily and the creed. That is the end. We've proclaimed our faith. And we've met, I've mentioned this before, is that the way even the buildings were structured at one time, and you still have it in, I don't know, most of the churches have dropped this tradition, but I think in Ethiopia, the deacons still at the end of where the creed would be will still turn and say, the doors, the doors. Because it's meant the ushers are supposed to close the door where the public sinners who are moving towards their full reconciliation and the catechumens have been back in the vestibule and now the door shut. They're done. They, you know, they either stay to go out to breakfast with the people who are still inside or, or they go home at that point. One of the two. 
But the doors, the doors is reminding, that's the end of the first section. <coughs> also in passing, he will mention this word homily. Homily is used all the time now. But strictly speaking, a homily is an explanation of the sacred text. Technically, that's what a homily. homily homilia means that you're explaining the sacred text. So you have had homilies nonstop, week after week, for the last two years. Because yesterday was the anniversary, May 7th, 4.30 p.m., Sunday afternoon, driving up here in 2017. So yesterday was the two-year anniversary. So from that point, you have had homilies every single, uh, every single week um, from that time. Okay? First year was the Gospels, the second year is the Epistles. Next year, what you're going to, so probably in June, what I'm going to do, what you're going to have in the bulletin will be the Gospels again. But the Gospels are going to be the English translation of the Peshitta. So you'll see them as being slightly different. I have been moving you in that direction by putting in Yeshua Mashiho, or you will, this weekend you will have Yeshua Moran, Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes? Peshitta, please explain. We'll get to it when we do the scriptures. Otherwise we'll get off to a totally different time. That's the Syriac scriptures. Okay, thank you in the Syriac tradition. And I don't know why we don't use an English translation of that. It, it, they're, they're almost identical, but there are little tweaks in it. You know. And so, that, in that, so the homily, and if it's in a sermon, a sermon is just a teaching with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It could be on anything. So next year are going to be sermons starting in the fall because they're going to be on liturgical things, the liturgical year, they're going to be on how to make the sign of the cross, how to do... They're going to be on all these different things, and they will be sermons, properly speaking, because I will not be explaining to you. I may bounce off of a part of the text, but the purpose will not be to explain the epistles and the gospels. That I've been doing for two years now. Okay? This next coming year is on this liturgical life and this expansion of the whole structure. And then we'll see where God takes us for year th four and five and six. And so you said we're kind of like a guinea pig, is what you're trying to imply? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. You, you have the possibility of entering the most deeply because you can't yeah, ask questions true. during a sermon. So on the contrary, and you have to be able to transmit to those who don't come, when you don't even come to the house of God, you need to be able to communicate that. I can't be to the voice of to people that I never see or that I bump into only at a grocery store or a restaurant. I can't evangelize somebody in the middle of a restaurant. Yes? Is there any reason that you could not accept questions during a sermon? Absolutely, because it's a teaching which is a proclamation being given. Okay. It's not a, it's not a lecture. This is a lecture format. So you can ask questions here. This is why we do this. You know. And I think if more people understood that, they would, they would make the effort to come because they could ask those questions. Because what happens is, as Catholics, they kind of, it's a, it's a DYI, the religion, right? You kind of just make it up as you go along, you know? So, it, even on morals. Well, um, And so it's important that we explain these things. So in the sermons, we wind up giving the proclamation and explanation or teaching sermon. When you're announcing about the Bible studies, perhaps you could put something in there about the opportunity to ask questions. I, but I've even mentioned that in announcements and everything, too. I mean, I have. Oh, okay. I have. The problem that what winds up coming to is you know that the more you give everybody, the more hard their judgment's going to be because they've been given more opportunities. If I left everybody just kind of ignorant, you know, wandering lost in the, in the streets, except for a genetic relationship to some old lady who was here in the 1920s, um, <laughs> to put it bluntly, <laughs> that's, that's, salvation won't come that way. Yeah. And that's why our Lord says in the Gospel, if I had not come, their sin would not be as great. And he speaks about the scribes and the Pharisees. But since I have come, they have no excuse. So I mean, our Lord gives that terminology in the Gospel. Every step that we make, every day that is given to us, comes with light and grace. Because in theory, we're meant to be walking closer to the kingdom every day. And so if we're not, that means we've repudiated days in which God has been speaking to us because God gives sufficient light to everyone to save their soul. Right? So that's why this is a different structure. This is why it was never a problem for the Latins up until the 60s to do the readings in Latin. Because it's not a Bible study. It's a proclamation of the Word of God. You know? And if you went to some of our parishes, they'd be reading the epistle in Arabic. 
Good luck. <laughs> Yeah, it, might work for a, it might work for a big chunk of the parish, but you know. But even if they were read in Syria, the main point, this is where we do Bible study. This is a liturgical action of proclaiming the word. Okay? And that's why it's interesting to see that in the old Latin rites for ordinations, when you are ordained as a deacon, or ordained as a subdeacon for the epistles, or ordained as a deacon, you were handed the book, the bishop's hand went on top of yours, as you placed your hand on the pages and on the cover, he placed his hand over the top, and the essential words were, receive the power to proclaim the gospel for the living and the dead. Mm -hmm. Just like the priest receiving the chalice and the altar bread, for the ability to offer sacrifice for the living and the dead. So it's always important to understand that what takes place up here is not a Bible study or a Bible reading. That's why I emphasize so much about being reader, a lector, is because you are proclaiming, the, you are the vehicle of the voice of God in that divine presence. And that's why it can be for the living or the dead. No one can do a Bible study for the living or the dead. Okay? So that's why the homily is also a liturgical action, which is why it's only reserved to priests. And it's one of the reasons why we don't do eulogies in churches. And you can talk about the family all you want down in a place like this, but and the altar and the sanctuary is a place where you have the voice of God. Yes. How were Peter and Deeb and Steve becoming deacons? What did they do for them? I've seen an ordination for a priest, but I've never seen it for a deacon. So what did you? What did Steve do that was different Sorry. than what? Yeah, I, I had a. It was a. It was an ordination. They. It, you got a letter around what was told, didn't you? Yeah, I got. I for for deacon for a cantor cantor lector sub deacon, and and they did have the laying of the hands, and I did for the reading of the epistle. It was almost like a deacon, and deacon's a little bit different, but yeah, the I, I actually have a video of it if you want to the see it. ceremonies will have a resemblance. Yeah. When my son was uh, ordained and uh, they uh, wiped his hands, you know, he wiped his hands from the oil on the manuturgium and it was given in, given to me to be bare, you know. They don't I, usually wipe it on the manuturgium. So the no, hands he, are they wiped, he wiped his hands on this cloth. Oh, really? Yeah. After he was, uh, after they had anointed his hands. So, yeah, the hands get anointed, then they close, and then you wrap a linen around them. Yeah, but no, they it, his hands were white because there's oil yeah. on it. No, no, I know, but the manitergium is to keep his hands closed. It's not for wiping the hands off. Does it smell like chrism? Mm -hmm. oh, well, maybe they did now. I don't know. That's not. But the original ceremony is just wrapped around to close their hands, and then they go back up and they will touch the chalice and that. No, but it, anyway, his hands were white. Now, do yeah, because you go from the thumb, you go from this thumb down to the forefinger because these are the fingers that touch the Eucharist. That's right. So you go from this thumb to this index finger, and from this thumb to this index finger. And then the oil is rubbed all over the hands after that. And then they close the hands and they wrap it in the linen strip. Well, my get to get back to my question, uh, in the uh, Maronite rite, do they have something like that for the mothers of priests? Well, of course, it's not done for the mothers. The purpose is, is to have the hand. If well, you I, know, saw, I know the original purpose is, is, is not yes, for that. Yes, I think, I can't remember now when I was in Damascus, the, I think that there was still, they picked it up from the Latins to do it. I know the hands of the Maronites are anointed. The other Easterners don't, don't anoint the hands. Okay. okay. So what did he do? So what happens, with the, what happens with the linen strip that's wrapped his hands during the ordinations, that, the tradition is, is that is given to the mother and it goes in her hands in the coffin. It's, and his is not a strip, it's a square. Oh, okay. Well, it was, but it was folded up so that it was a... But so yes, yeah, so it would fold it, it would fold it up so that it would have wrapped around his hands. So at my death, uh, you know. Yeah. So normally we have a rosary. Yes. They yeah. probably don't know that. So now I'm like, you know, when you have you put a, you put the body laid out, you put a rosary in their hands or a crucifix or something. The mothers of priests have that linen that wrap their son's hands at the ordination mm -hmm. is put in her hands in the coffin. She's buried with it. So you oh, have that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Because just like we talked about the mother of God on Sunday, and we'll talk about the Mother of God again this Sunday. 
and those names of, of the kings, mothers, <coughs> not the, to, only for the kings of Judea, but in the books of kings. So the same thing that in the traditional prayers for the Latin liturgy, you have prayer, the only specific prayers for the dead for a funeral are for a pope, cardinal, priest, bishop, and everyone else is just a dead man or a dead woman, you know, fill in the line, end, end. Except there is also, so we have pope, bishop, priest, and the mother and the father of a priest. Yeah, so my husband, they are they my are husband has a stole, has uh, my son's stole that would be buried with him. Well, perhaps they do that now, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But normally it was just the, 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 the hand, the monetary, the linen strip that was done in the hands. You know. And when they told my mother that, it kind of freaked her out. <laughs> <laughs> it was 30 years ago, she didn't really want to hear about it. Well, when you're dead, <laughs> yeah. uh, a redemptorist priest who was there, and he was so excited about this ordination in Switzerland, so like, he couldn't help but just like tell my mother enthusiastically about this tradition. She's like, oh, well, well that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing my mother, I could tell, okay, now she's like freaking out. Okay. <laughs> the, the one other uh, part of that I heard is that, uh, you know, like you said, you're going to be asked as to what you did, uh, with, you know, for your children, and that the, uh, that, that uh, Cognation cloth is, is basically her proof of what she did for her children. But, she part, gave yes. her son. but no, but the church has always seen the mother of a priest being very much the reflection of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of God. That's why that special symbolism goes with them in the coffin. You know, the mothers of priests have always been honored in that way. You know, because the priest by the sacrament of holy orders very much becomes an extension of the reality of Jesus Christ, the Word incarnate. Which is why you can say, I absolve you of your sins. This is my body. This is my blood. Nothing to do with him as a man, but he becomes the living vehicle, the conscious instrument of Christ incarnate. So it's pretty impressive. So we'll, you know, we'll cover some of these things as we go on. But, you know, so this is part of that ordination. The imposition of hands is always signifying the transfer of power and authority to do this. And so the imposition, you know, will have that aspect. The lesser ceremonies will be the transfer of the book. You know, those are the things when the book is being committed to you, not the imposition of hands. And so, um, the reader, uh, cantor, you know, for the singing, and also then subdeacon just means everybody under a deacon. So often it refers to those who are serving the altar. But we we're talking about these linens. If you see the traditional rites of a consecration of a bishop, they look like they've been hit by a bus. And the ceremony, because oil, you know, they put a tonsure. They will shave part of their head because oil is poured on their heads. Oil is consecrated on their forehead. Oil is placed back on their hands. Linens cover this. Linen goes around this. And then, of course, because they are venerable in their age, the hands that are folded also have a linen that goes around their neck and around their arms to hold the hands up as they go through the rest of the ceremony. So when you look at them, you see these men who have got this linen around their forehead, linen around their hands again, linen around their neck, holding up their hands. They look like they've been hit by a car. <laughs> but you have all of that aspect. And so, and for them, when it's time for the litany of the saints, they don't prostrate on the full floor. They're on the steps of the side of the altar, going up the altar. So you have these, all these different ceremonies, and, and the deeper you go into our faith, the more profoundly beautiful it is. It's a, that was what becomes the most kind of, you know, sad. I won't even say aggravated, it's just sad that so many baptized Catholics couldn't give two hoots about learning anything more deeply. When you know that as you go, and I am still learning, you know, after decades, and I'm always being bedazzled by how beautiful it is. Because ultimately, it allows you to touch the hidden one, you know, to come close to that reality. It's really quite stunning. So that's why this second point is, this is personal examination. This is the attentive listening to the voice of God. You know. So that's why when you come to the end of that whole section, we proclaim our faith, the creed. We believe. Yes? At the risk of opening the form, where you said that it's that uh, people should be getting lessons in regards to reading, and that women can do that as well. 
Well, how but it's you... paraliturgical. Women will never be ordained as a reader, even technically, even now. Oh, okay. Okay. We just appoint people. But technically, they're not ever actually ordained. You don't have ceremony. You don't have the ordination of readers outside of the male's gender. Okay. They have paraliturgical ceremonies which they've created, but technically they're not the actual ritual books. So then why is it that, and why is it, that it does say that women should not vote? Because they're all extensions of the priesthood. Oh. Ultimately, it's just the priest. And then the church has created these sacramental expressions of the one priesthood in reading and proclaiming and the cantering and the singing. And that's why, and that's why actually up until the 19th century too, in a lot of places, and we've mentioned how men will sit on one side, women on the other. That dates from the times of the synagogue. Um, but you also had um, the fact that the actual liturgical choirs, the ones who were singing, say, for example, the Gregorian chant, all male. Because that was the serving of the altar. Well, of course, you know, by, the, by the late 19th century, a lot of these things started to disappear. That's why you had the, the you know, infamously, why you had the castrati. The castrati, the, the castrated boys that were castrated oh, in the Renaissance oh, period. Oh. It was totally condemned by the church and, and all of the major churches. <coughs> uh, so it's a really very bizarre thing. So they're just castrated, so you keep these clear voices. Because there's nothing, when you hear a boys choir, you listen to Christ College or something, mm -hmm. forget about That's sopranos. Right. There is a mellowness to that high voice, and they're like, we want to keep that. You know, so they became the eunuchs of the Western world, and it was totally condemned by the church, but every, every pope during the Renaissance had castrati in their choirs. Oh. There's one until the 20th century, there's one left. Oh, you can, yeah. you, there's a recording That's of it. That's what I'm saying, is it's condemned, because it's, it, because it's sterilization. That's considered gravely morally sinful. Mm -hmm. You can't just simply, yes. Is there a special ceremony for the parents of nuns when they do their final orders, like Doreen and Bruce, when their son didn't. No, because the ordination is a sacrament. Mm -hmm. you know, this is a divine mystery. The vows, as Solomon, as beautiful as they are, are not, they're sacramental, but they're not a sacrament. So they may have ceremonies, yeah, you know, the old ceremony used to be the family, and specifically the father would escort his daughter to the doors of the cloister. There'd be a whole ceremony for knocking the doors, responses, and the sisters would open from the inside, and then your daughter would disappear forever into this cloister, and from now on you'll see her through a grill. And that's also the last time they'd be able to embrace their parents. So it's yeah, much less it's ceremonial for there. nuns? Sorry? It's must, much less ceremonial for nuns? Oh, no, some of it's quite profound. You see Carmelites, oh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're prostrate on, 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 and then the other sisters come out and put a, a black pall over them because mm -hmm. it indicates their death, so... And in some churches, where they used to have the, the religious are buried in the crypt underneath the church, you'd actually be, they have a grate in the floor. So as you're actually there as this young woman or young man, and you're laying down, you're actually looking for the grate at all of your predecessors who have died and gone to judgment. Right? Because the idea of religious life is you die to the world so that you live this fulfillment of the evangelical vows. It's not just wearing a pantsuit and having an apartment locally and doing social work. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's tragic that because, of, but you've noted, if you notice, every religious order that has kept their charism and their tradition, they got all kinds of young people in it. You know, religious life is not dying out, it's dying out in what's happened to religious life so many places. So, anyway, you know, so, and I, like I tell you over and over again, as an act of faith, I know that the more you become Maronite and profoundly understand your Antiochian tradition, you will make this place flourish. Okay. I don't know how, mm -hmm. but you will, because you will just be radiant examples of a very ancient tradition that has been viable for, well, a, a millennium and a half. So there's no reason why it still can't work in 2018, because it doesn't have anything to do with the people. It has to do with God working through the people. But not if we're trying to make it up as we go along. So the religious and the pantsuits at the local apartment who just wants to do social work, well, what 18-year-old girl wants to dedicate her life in celibacy to that? That's why the priests who have lost their vision of the divine transcendence of what it means to be a priest, what 18-year-old boy wants to be a celibate to be just a social worker? If I want to be a social worker, I can get married and have a family and be a social worker. But to touch that altar, and to be that vehicle of the voice of Christ in a very real and personal way through consecration of the sacrament of orders? 
guys still are. My religious congregation, we never had failure. When I joined our congregation in 1982, there were 80 priests in it, because it had only been founded in 1970. When I left to become a Maronite, we had 630, you know, in a 25-year in a 25, 25 period. So, you know, but, you know, we're registered. <laughs> I think you can figure that out, right? <laughs> <laughs> our, 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 our training was, you know, our training was strict, and, and uh, uh, what it also meant is that only one out of those three young men coming in statistically in the states ever made it through the seven-year formation. The vast majority went off; they left and went back to the world for various reasons. And so I could, you know, as vice rector of the seminary, people would visit and I'd say, well, actually, what we're in the business of doing is forming Catholic fathers, a few of whom actually are ordained priests. Because the vast majority came in and got two, three years of discipline and catechesis and philosophical training and discipline, and then, you know, some, some pretty young thing with green eyes, you know, to, uh, you know. So they'd come in and say, well, you know, Father, I'm not willing to show my vocation. So, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> I still remember hearing about that uh, mothers would actually uh, take their uh, daughters to a seminary because it was the best place to find husbands. We had one of our seminarians, he was one of the greatest young, uh, he was just, he was charming. And, and, but it was like that because they served, you know, we'd have these banquets for like 150 people for these ceremonies so the families would come for the ordinance and everything. And of course, the seminarians waited on the tables. And of course, one of these families, they come, you know, well, if you're going to be traditional Catholic, you know, that means not only is someone being ordained to something, he's got five or six or seven or eight brothers and sisters who are also going to show up at this banquet, right? <laughs> and of course, doubtless among them is going to be some, you know, also young woman who's there. And so this young guy had wound up meeting this young thing, serving tables. And over the time, they wound up, you know, forming a relationship through the brother, right? You know, this is different from having the football team and saying, you know, could maybe you ask, you know, your brother that, or your sister to, you know. <laughs> so the contact now was for the seminary. <coughs> but the day that he left, he was absolutely devastated because he really loved, he, he's gone on to have really a fantastic Catholic family. I mean, they're really a good couple. But it was devastating for him. He really, really, you know. So it isn't like they do this easily when you say, well, what's her name? And of course, well, a lot of men, you know, what's her name? And you decide that Jesus has a greater power and strength and beauty over you than those pretty green eyes. And so you go on to that next step. And when you have that vision, and all the orders that do that, all still have vocations coming in. Because God is still calling people to serve Him. Yes? Well, how does this, um, the Roman rite, you can't marry, but in the Syriac right, you, the Maronite so right, you can. No priest can ever marry. The question is, is ordaining married men? Oh, okay. But if he's widowed, you never marry again. You know, all of these deacons, these thousands of deacons all over the United States, technically, if their wife dies, they can't get married either. So these the retired bankers, you know, become deacons in their local parish and all that. You know, if their wife passes away, which is, you know, these things happen, they have to remain celibate. Oh, okay. Because priesthood doesn't marry. And the full fullness of the priesthood of the episcopacy, that's why bishops have always been celibate. There are no married bishops. There never have been historically, except for a very bizarre interim historically among what is known as the Jacobite Church in Syria. Um, and, and then even they <coughs> got that and went back to the original apostolic tradition. Yes. If I remember right, it's in that tradition of being able to be a married priest, at least in the West, go out because of what happened with the laws of progenitor during the 1000s? No, no. From the beginning, from the 300s, the Romans have always insisted. We, I mean, we have documents from the 300s, but even earlier than that, the Romans have always had, and even the East also recognizes the priesthood in its perfection should be transcendently celibate because of the altar. That's why. It has nothing to do with it. The reason why a priest is celibate is because of these divine mysteries, because of what he is meant to be doing. But in the East, what happened is, is they started identifying celibacy with monastic vocation. And a lot of times, too, historically, it was, we need a priest in this village. And a lot of times, it became a family heritage. Why do you think you meet so many churis? 
right? You know, so many Hudi families because they're just, that was a family tradition. <coughs> One of my sons is going to follow me in this parish. <coughs> and it became a heritage, you know, either five generations of the same family being a local parish priest. So they go away, they get their teaching, <coughs> you know, they'd be apprenticed to someone, and when you thought they were ready enough, you'd ordain them, and then they kept farming their same little acre and a half that they did when they were just peasants with everybody else. But the, for, but the perfection of the priesthood was always understood in its celibacy. That's why the episcopacy has always been celibate. They usually are taken from the monks or from widowed priests, uh, widowers. And so, and what's funny is I was talking to a Greek Orthodox priest about this when I was visiting Athens once, and he told me, he says, but even for the people, if they want serious spiritual direction, they'll go to the monastery, the celibate monks, they'll go for the mysteries at the local parish, receive communion, do all that, anointing my sick and all. You know, the actual function, but if they really want to go deep into the spiritual life, they'll go to the monastery for direction from the celibate layman. Now, not all cases, of course, and it's not to say, but I remember when I was walking, what initiated that conversation is we were walking along and there was a priest on the other side walking by, you know, in Athens, we're all in our cassettes. And he looks over at him and he says, he's married. And I said, how do you know that? And he says, because you can tell. <laughs> and he's in a cassock from outside, he's just, you can tell. But the priest that I was talking to was celibate. Hmm. But he says, you, can, you, you just, the way they carry themselves, what they're doing, you they know. They have the worldly concerns that are... There's just something the different. I mean, that was his opinion. I mean, I, to me, <laughs> he looked like a priest. I mean, I didn't really pay much attention. But of course, I didn't live in a world where you have these distinctions between married priests and, and celibate priests, right? <laughs> But even now in this eparchy, we won't, you know, in the Eastern eparchy, a man can be a married man can be ordained to the priesthood, but only after his, the youngest child is is already past majority. So basically, it's going to be people only in their fifties. But in the Western eparchy, they'll ordain younger men. Okay. Well, the, the Russian Orthodox, that guy was yeah. married, and yeah, he just course, has the East. another set of kids. That's the East, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so the Russians. So I wanted to, I did, well, I did want to finish this up, but um, we'll come back. We'll come back to this because there's too much to say on three and four. A two we've got done, two we've done at the bottom here. Next week, bring your letter of the patriarch, because we are going to go back, because the patriarch's letter is not just about Lent. It's about the discipline of the entire year in it. So we're going to finish points three and four, those parallels. Then we will finish the introduction, and then we'll go to the Patriarch's letter. And then, if we don't finish it, then we'll do the Patriarch's letter and start the first chapter on the second week, and then we'll be done for this season. And then we can go into the summer cerebral meltdown. Uh, uh, All right. Finish up. Right? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. O oh God, you are, you are before all ages, and exist from age to age. You are, you are resplendent and glorified in unsearchable light. Through your word, you bring forth light and give us each day. O oh, radiant day and source of all light, we glorify you, adore you, and offer you praise night and day. Accept our praise and answer our prayer. Send us your abundant blessings through the mercy of your Messiah, to him with you and the Holy Spirit, be glory, honor, power, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us to have recourse to you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Right. Have a good evening. Beautiful to see you.